All right, let's look at another momentum situation here. In this situation, we have these two blocks, and they're both pushed into a spring. So the spring is compressed as the blocks are brought close together. They're, the whole system's at rest there. The spring's compressed through some distance d. And we know the um, force constant for the spring, d, is given, and then assume that the blocks are released. So they're released from rest there. When they're released, what we know about that is that they slide. They're initially in on um, some kind of frictionless surface, say, or there's frictionless interfaces right when they're released. And then the, each block slides onto a like frictiony patch, right, a rough patch. What we're told here is that block one slides through some distance S1 before coming to rest, and block two slides through some distance S2 before coming to rest. We're going to assume that the frictional coefficient is the same. Again, their uh, masses are different, so it doesn't mean the forces are the same, right? Just that the coefficients are. We're given the two masses, spring constant, um, D, the spring compression, and then those two distances there. S1 and S2, and we're asked to determine what is the coefficient of kinetic friction, assuming it's the same for both interfaces. Okay, so there's kind of a lot going on here, but we can handle it. Um, if we look at this right off the bat here, I don't know where your mind might go to start. You might think initially that, okay, if we look at this, we have what's called an explosion, right? So usually when we use momentum, we use it in a case of either a collision or an explosion, some kind of event. So this is an event that we can consider to be an explosion. So let me just start there since momentum is kind of our, the, our main topic right now. So we could say, you know, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to apply conservation of momentum to the explosion. And then we have to ask ourselves if we're allowed to do that. So we can only do that if we have to ask ourselves is the external forces, are the external forces, the sum, is the sum of external forces equal to zero? And in order to really answer that question, we need to define our system. So external to what? And our system in this case is going to be the two blocks, M1, M2, and the spring. Okay, those are all going to be part of our system there. So now we need to choose, like, what is our initial and final state going to be? So we can say, well, the initial state for momentum is going to be when everything's at rest and the spring is compressed through some distance d, right? And the spring has energy there, sure, but it doesn't have any momentum. There's no momentum in the system. In order to have momentum, something has to be moving. Right? Let's remember that our momentum is a vector quantity equal to the product of mass and velocity, which is vector. So velocity is zero for everything here because everything's released from rest. So just notice that, take that in, that you have, there's obviously potential energy in this situation, but momentum is zero. So initially my momentum is zero. And then I have to choose what is going to be my final momentum, right? What In what state is the system when I'm going to be comparing it? And I cannot use anything later when the blocks are already on the frictiony patch because friction is an external force to the system. Think about it. So we can no longer use conservation of momentum there. So that's out. I can't use that. What I can do, though, is I can say, well, the moment that I'm looking at, my final for momentum is going to be after the blocks leave the spring, when they um, are no longer in contact with the spring, and they're both moving at their own velocities, right, in opposite directions toward their little frictiony patches. Okay, at that moment. So at that moment, I could say, sure, my external forces are zero. The only forces on the masses there was they're kind of flying on the frictionless patch there is going to be their weights and normal forces. So those will sum to zero. There's no acceleration in the vertical here. So cool. Um, and what I'm going to do is put a sign convention on this situation. So I will say here, right word positive. Momentum, again, is a vector, so we need to care about that. So in the final case, then that means that the momentum for block two is positive. The momentum for block one is negative. So my final momentum, I can write that as M2 V2 minus M1 V1. Cool.
So I can put those together in a conservation of momentum statement and say that therefore M1 V1 is equal to M2 V2. Notice no hats there, right? Because I already took the directions into consideration with my signs when I was treating them as vectors. So, all right, that rendered me doing my momentum analysis on the explosion there did render me an equation. And then you might argue that like, hey, you can apply energy analysis to the explosion too. And you'd be right, you can. So let's switch up colors and let's do that here. We can say we're going to apply energy analysis. So that'll be delta E equals sum of the work step on by non-conservative forces, right? We're going to apply that to the explosion. So we haven't even gotten to the frictiony part yet, but we have to like wring as much information as we can out of this situation. So we'll get there. So if we're just looking at the explosion, I can say, well, initially, where was all the energy? It was in the potential form in the spring, right? When everything was still before it was released, the spring, we're told the spring is compressed at distance D. So initially, one half K D squared. That's it. All my energy is in spring potential form. And then everything is released, and that energy turns into the kinetic energy of both those blocks, right? So I can write that as 1 half m1 v1 squared plus 1 half m2 v2 squared. This is energy here. These are scalar. They're both positive. Direction doesn't matter here, right? These are scalar quantities. It's simply how much mass, how fast. We're really considering speed. Um, I don't have, this is all horizontal. I don't have any change in elevation. So I don't have any gravitational potential energy. If I'm just looking at the frictionless patch, so again, I'm just bounded. This is pre, before we get on to where there's any friction at all, um, then I my work, my non-conservative works are going to be equal to zero. If I think about the free body diagram um, for one of these masses, I'm going to have normal force, um, normal force weight. We can do, we can look at one of these. So if I'm going to look at one of these, say, um, I don't know, M1, I'll have M1G, its weight, I'll have some normal force on that, and that's it, right? When it's after it's lost contact with the spring, which is my energy final case there, there's nothing else going on there. And mass one's displacement is going to be to the left there. It's at a right angle to the normal force. The normal force does not do any work in this case. All right, so the work done by my non-conservative forces is equal to zero here. So that gives me a nice energy statement then. Um, that lets me know that I can write my energy statement as, I'm going to go back to green since um, that's what I'm using, my energy statement as 1 half kd squared is equal to, initial and final energies are then equal, 1 half m1 v1 squared plus one half m2 v2 squared. And that's another equation that I've generated. So those equations aren't enough, obviously, to solve for the coefficient because I don't even have the coefficient on the page yet, but um, that's just an example of like, what can I learn from, what kind of information can I get from energy analysis and what kind of information can I get from momentum analysis? And the two equations are different. Okay, um, now we can start looking at the frictiony patch. And as soon as we get into the frictiony patch, we know that, okay, we're no longer using momentum analysis because now we have an external force here that is non zero. So momentum analysis isn't our tool. Remember that we use a momentum analysis when we're analyzing some kind of event, something that takes place over a very short amount of time, a collision or explosion. The block sliding to rest over the frictiony patch isn't really an event. That's more of what I would describe as a process. So these processes, when we analyze those, we tend to analyze processes using energy analysis, or you could use force analysis, but our topic is more closely related to energy, so I'm going to use that here. Um, so we can use energy analysis for the sliding blocks then. So
let's apply now again we're using energy analysis so delta e equals sum of works by non-conservative forces now to um, how about we'll start with looking at m2 sliding on the frictiony patch right sliding to the right on the frictiony patch okay so initially Where's my energy? Well, it's in, and I'm going to call this, um, let's see, I'm going to prime this. I, I don't want to use the exact same symbol that I did for earlier when I was, I was using E0 because I don't want that to be confusing. So I'll prime this. This is now the initial energy now for the friction patch is the energy now just block M2 had, right, as it was sliding onto the friction patch. And we know that it had kinetic energy at that point. So 1 half m2 v2 squared. Remember that its speed doesn't change as it travels across the frictionless patch. So this is the kinetic energy just as it enters the patch with friction. And its final mechanical energy is going to be, remember, it comes to rest. It comes to rest, it doesn't change elevation, doesn't compress a spring or anything like that. So there's no more mechanical energy in that system. The work, the non-conservative work that's done here is going to be done by friction. So if we're looking at a free body diagram for M2 on the frictiony patch now, we know that we've, we're going to have weight downward, we're going to have normal force upward, and then kinetic friction to the left. That's responsible for the acceleration of the block, which would be directed to the left since the block is slowing down. So the work done by non-conservative forces, that's just going to be the scalar product of my frictional force dotted in with my displacement, which is S2 in this case. Cool. So I'm going to um, kind of continue this along the bottom here. Well, I guess I can do one more line here. So energy final minus initial equals the work done by friction here. So that'll be energy final minus energy initial, one half m2 v2 squared, is equal to the work done by friction. And that's going to be my frictional force here, right? Which is mu k times the normal force, n2, uh, multiplied by my displacement, which is s2, multiplied by the cosine of the angle between them which is 180 degrees. My displacement is to the right. The force of friction is directed to the left. They're 180 degrees apart. So that gives me a relationship, 1 half m2 v2 squared is equal to mu k. And now in place of the normal force, I can do a quick Newton second law analysis on the vertical for my free body diagram for mass two. And in place of normal force 2, I can pop in m2g here, multiplied by s2, multiplied by, oh, not by negative 1, because I'm going to um, multiply the, the whole thing through by negative 1. So notice that we have a minus sign in front of the one half, in front of the kinetic energy term here on the left, and then the, this cosine 180 gives us a minus sign or a negative one on the right. So those can cancel each other out. And then I will be left with this relationship right here. And then of course we can generate a fourth relationship, right? A fourth equation um, and by looking at mass one and doing the exact same analysis that we just did for mass 2. We can do that exact same analysis for mass 1 and we can render another equation there. Those equations, you'll pull those equations together algebraically and you'll be able to solve for the coefficient of kinetic friction.